We'll wait for a few more people. Very few people are there. Ten. We're on core. Yeah, we're getting a good group. All right. Hello. Hi, Morton Carmi. Hi. Oh, you know, like this with them because of their English connection. We have to wave to them like this. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Ten so far. Could you pass my glasses? Uh, are you going to mute us or do you want us to just all mute ourselves so that there's no background noise when you're speaking? Uh, I think that's up to David to control uh, what's going on. Sure, I'll, I'll, I'll mute everyone. And um, if you want to say anything, before please chat. Like, um, Michelle. Yeah. Let's start it. Uh, okay. Uh, this subject tonight, what about the Bible? is to me uh, something that I really love to talk about. Uh, I've been teaching Bible, I'd say for, um, well, close to 70 years in various venues. And uh, it, it's, it's a book that I love and that I go back to time after time after time. And the, the attitude that I have toward the Bible, which we'll discuss as we go along, is quite different from the attitudes that many people have toward the Bible. To begin with, let me state it very clearly. I do not believe that the Bible is the word of God. On the other hand, uh, well, as I said in the introduction to my book, I said I, I reverently study the word of God, and it does not matter to me uh, whether or not God has spoken these words, what we call the word of God. Bible. But before we get into the subject of uh, uh, what our attitude should be, considering our theology toward the Bible, uh, let's talk a little bit about what the Bible is. Uh, you know, one of the reasons why I enjoy going to BZBI is because there are a lot of congregants at BZBI who are pretty knowledgeable in Jewish things. And, and it's a pleasure, you know, when you're, especially when you're reading the Torah, or listening to a sermon, to know that there are people around you who understand what's going on. It, it's a, it's a, for a, lot, a, a big part, it's an educated congregation. And that makes it pleasant to be there and, and share with people. But, you know, Jews generally do not really have an idea of what the Bible is, what it's made up of. To begin with, does anybody know what the origin of the word is, the Bible? What does the Bible mean? Anybody? Well, it comes from Greek, tabiblia, which means, which means the books. The books. That's what the Bible means. The books. Uh, how many books are there in the Bible? Does anybody know? Yes, uh, Ira. Ira, I can't hear you, but I see you waving. Not, well, not wave, but supposedly five. No, that's the Torah. The Torah that's, has five that's books. The Torah. Ah, the, the, the whole Tanakh. 30, 30 the Tanakh. No. 39. Yeah, 39. Right, okay. Would anybody disagree if I said that there are 24 books that's in the Bible and that you're right when you say 39? I was close. How could that be? <laughs> There are 39 yeah. books in the Bible. There are 24 books in the Bible. How could that be? Elkan, you have something to say? No? Yeah, the minor prophets, they right. count. The, the minor prophets, they count as one or as 12. Right, what about the minor prophets? Right, the minor prophets it's are 12. A, one book and 12 in the count, when you count, books, when you say that, when you say that there are 24 books in the Bible, it means that you're counting the 12 minor prophets as one. 
What, right. Anything else that you're counting differently? Um, you, you don't count the apocrypha. Well, that's out, right? Kamesh no, Megillot. Kamesh Megillot are counted as one. The five Megillot are counted okay. as one oh. book. All right, oh. now Samuel okay. 1 and Samuel 2 are one book. Kings 1 and one Kings book, okay. 2 are one book. Chronicles okay. 1 and Chronicles okay. 2 are one book. That's why okay. if, if, you were to, were, if you were to look at many editions of the Hebrew Bible back in the uh, 18th and 19th century, you would see that the Bible is called the, the Esrim V'arba, the 24. So that there are, the, by that count, not counting the Hamesh Megillot, the five Megillot as five, but rather as one, and not counting the minor prophets as 12, but rather as one, and so on, you get the yeah. number of 24. Now, uh, again, the word Bible, what's our Hebrew word for Bible? Tanakh. Hebrew word for Bible? Tanakh, right? Tanakh. It's a word that you all know, Tanakh. Except that Tanakh, Tanakh is, is not a word. What is Tanakh? Torah, Torah, Nevi, Prophet. And the Ketuvim and the writings. Yeah, so we really don't have a Hebrew right. word for Bible. We, we simply call it the Tanakh, which is the Torah, the prophets, and, and the writings, but no uh, particular word right. uh, for it. Uh, uh, the, the, uh, I did a little research when writing the book to find out what the attitude is in mainline Protestantism and in Islam as to the reading of their scripture, the reading of the Bible. And what is their attitude? Their attitude is that after they read a portion of scripture, they, the, the, uh, the uh, minister will say, the word of God. And the congregation will then give an affirmation that this is the word of God. In Islam, after they read from the Quran, they say a formula beginning with the word sadaqa, which means righteousness that this is righteously the word of God. Do we have any statement in Judaism, something that you might be familiar with, that indicates our faith that this is the word of God? Something you Sota all know Torah very well. Share. Sota, exactly, ha -Torah? exactly. The Torah, yeah. Asher, Samoshe. Lifnei b'nei Yisrael al pi Adonai b'yad Moshe. So what does that mean? This is the Torah that Moses put. Asher sam Moshe be Asher sam Moshe lifnei before the people of Israel at the mouth of God. At the mouth of God. Now, understanding the concept of God as we've been. What is that? Somebody had something to say? All right. Understanding the concept of God as we've been discussing it over the past uh, three weeks, what does it mean to say that this is the word of God if we do not believe that God is corporeal, that God has a body? Does God have a mouth? Uh, does God have any physical features? So how can we say that this Torah is the word of God, that it came from God? Any thoughts on that subject as to how, why we would refer to the Bible as the word of God? Zosa Torah she sam Moshe lifnei b'nei Yisrael. Any thoughts on that? Do we think it's true? No. Well, I want to quote, if you've you read the book, I'm going to quote a, a, Russian, a Russian symbolist poet who, to me, uh, epitomizes my belief in how we should treat the, the, the Bible as the word of God. He said that, that he, he quoted it in, uh, in Latin, Are realibus ad realora which means from the merely real to the highest reality. Now, what was he saying? 
from the merely real to the highest reality. Any ideas on that? What is he getting at? All right. I was hoping that be you know much more responsible. I would. I was going to say if you substitute maybe the word truth for the highest reality, it feels more. I can't say makes sense, but um, that maybe the right. something that's real right. has a kind of intrinsic. Um, you sense that you're confirming that this is uh, this is how things how things are, or what they are. That there's an int intrinsic the truth. Real. The word is real. Let me put it like this. Let me put it like this. There are many, many stories in the Bible that I do not believe at all are true. Yet, when those stories are told century after century by a people, they affect the culture in such a way that, to my way of thinking, those stories become true, even though they were not true. In the beginning, a story was told, mere reality. But as, the, as time goes on, as the story grows, as the lessons from those stories grow uh, uh, more and more weighty and have a greater influence on our culture, they become real. Uh, let's see if, if I can give you um, an example of that. You all know the story of the Akedah, right? Do you believe that Abraham took Isaac up on Mount Moriah and was going to kill his only son? Anybody believes that? I certainly don't. So the question then becomes, okay. why was that story told? Why is that story in the Bible? Because what that story teaches us is very, very true. The story is false, but what it teaches us is true. What does it teach us? People the prohibition against uh, about child sacrifice. Good. Yeah. Prohibition against child sacrifice. Now, why? Why would the Torah go out of its way to tell this elaborate story, this very dramatic story, and, you know, we read it every Rosh Hashanah. It's, you know, one of the high points of the Rosh Hashanah uh, service. Why would our tradition have put that, that uh, story there to teach us about the prohibition against child sacrifice? Why did we need a prohibition? Isn't it obvious that we should not do child sacrifice? Yeah. Why do we need it? Because it was, uh, okay. it was something yeah. taking place in the culture of the time. Other cultures. Right. Right. How, how do we know? Well, right, firstly, it was common in other cultures, uh, even some of the South American uh, Inca and other uh, cultures <clears throat> did have human sacrifice. But um, how do we know from stories elsewhere in the Bible that some Jews actually practiced the sacrifice of their firstborn sons? In fact, the, the whole idea of Pidyon Haben, redeeming the firstborn son, is because so that you should not sacrifice the son, you redeem the son by giving a certain amount of money to a Kohen. How do we know that this actually took place in ancient Israel? Because they asked, the rabbis asked to, ordered them to destroy the other temples that were practicing that in the Valley of Hinnom. Right, uh, only one thing wrong with what you said, not the rabbis. This, this, is about, this is about six or seven hundred years before there were rabbis. Okay. Maybe, that, maybe it was a better world then when there were no rabbis. But uh, the, even, the prophets, especially Jeremiah, described this horrible practice that was going on in what's called the Gay Ben Hinnom, the valley of, of, uh, of the son of Hinnom, Gay Ben Hinnom. The valley, the valley of Hinnom was outside of Jerusalem, uh, going up to the Mount Olives. The valley that exists between the old city of Jerusalem and Mount Olives was the Valley of Hinnom. And in the Valley of Hinnom, according to Jeremiah, and there are a couple of other instances in the Book of Kings that describe 
how Jews were bringing their children to sacrifice. Uh, the, the motivation, why? Well, the same motivation as with the first fruits and the first animals. The idea is if you go, give God what God has given you to begin with, if you return the favor of God, that God will bless you with more and more and more. That's the idea of, of, uh, of sacrifice of first fruits, sacrifice of the uh, first animal, and human sacrifice. But human <laughs> sacrifice was such a horrendous thing that the prophets spoke out against it. And speaking out against it is not enough. You need something, a story, to tell you that God did not want this to happen. So somebody takes the story of Abraham and Isaac, Isaac, the first Jewish child, the first Hebrew child, and Ab Abraham feels the pious impulse to sacrifice Isaac because Isaac is the first fruits that God gave to him. So he feels the impulse to sacrifice him back to God. And what does God say as he's about to plunge the knife? The angel appears and does what? Stop him. The angel says, not to touch uh, the child, not yeah, to touch the child. Yeah. And by the way, there's an interesting midrash on that. Who, who command, according to the story, who commanded Abraham to sacrifice Isaac? God, right? Who commanded him yeah. not to? The angel. The angel God. intervened the and angel. told him not to sacrifice. What's that? Elkan? <clears throat> No, I say you're right. The, no. the angel, uh, he, he must have acted on God's behalf. He, he acted on God's. He acted on God's acted behalf. On God's behalf. Right. The midrash tells us right. that only God could order the, the murder, but to not do the murder, right. even an angel is sufficient to countermand the word of God, because mm -hmm. of, of mercy, because of a, a real understanding that God is. This is not something that God would want. So an angel is sufficient to change that course, even though God has commanded it. So you see, here's a, a story given to us in the Bible, which is absolutely untrue. It never happened. It never happened. But the story is true. Why is the story true? Because it teaches us something which has become a fundamental part of Judaism and civilization since the time that that story was first told. And there are many, many stories, similar stories in, in, the, in the Bible. Uh, we talked uh, either last week or the week before about the story of the Garden of Eden, which is an amazing story, an amazing story that, uh, that, uh, that human beings were like little puppets in the hand of God, you know, roaming innocently through the garden with not a thought until they were uh, uh, sort of uh, uh, um, uh, seduced by the uh, evil uh, serpent who tells them to eat from the tree of knowledge and they eat from the tree of knowledge and therefore they are forbidden to, to be in the, in the garden. They have to leave the garden. Now what, what does that story teach us? It never happened, it never happened. I guarantee you it never happened, but it taught something great something very fundamental, very important to us. And what is that? One, I think, is that it's the nature of human beings to pursue knowledge, regardless of the cost. That's one thing. The other Good. possibility also is that, although I'm not a big fan of this one necessarily, that God is the source of all knowledge, that God possesses knowledge and and can dispense it. And uh, I like, the, uh, I like the, 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 the story about the nature of human beings, that no matter what the cost is, we're gonna pursue knowledge <laughs> and it's gonna cost us our innocence. Exactly. What does it mean to be, to be uh, thrown out of the Garden of Eden? It means to lose your innocence. Remember, the same part of that story tells about how they were wandering naked through the garden. And when they got knowledge, they covered themselves with fig leaves. So there, there is a, a, a component, a, sort of a sexual component to that story also. But the, uh, the idea is that we lose our innocence, uh, wandering around like little animals, 
uh, in, the, in the state of nature, uh, unclothed and so on, is very, very nice. But to have knowledge, to have knowledge means that we have all of the burdens of knowledge, the burdens of knowledge. We, once we know the difference between right and wrong, then we are no longer innocent. And the choice then becomes ours. We'd already discussed free will. I don't want to go into that again. But the idea is that, that the human being, once he is uh, uh, thrown out of the Garden of Eden, then becomes a, a creature who has the choice between good and evil. So a ver again, a very, very important story uh, in, in the Bible. And there are so many of these stories which on, on the face are not true. They never happen, but they taught us a great, great lesson. Let's take the story of the, uh, the Exodus from Egypt. What, what's, the fundamental, what's the fundamental teaching of the story of, of uh, Pharaoh and Moses and, and, uh, and the uh, Exodus from Egypt? What's it teaching us? What does God want? It means that, that the, the human being is not intended to live in, in slavery to any other human being. That what God wants is for people to be free, to be masters of their own destiny. And we could not exist as a people. We could not have any effect on, on culture as long as we were a slave people. Once we were redeemed, and went out into the desert. And going into the desert is a cleansing process. By the way, that's a very interesting aspect uh, in, in the Bible. The desert, in, in many of the prophets, is considered the place of cleansing. It's the place where, uh, where uh, sort of the, the desert blasting sands purify a, a person. When Elijah was very uh, puzzled about what he should do, what did he do? He went out to the desert. And there's sort of an idealism about going out to the desert. It's sort of reflected, if uh, many of you, uh, when you've been to Israel and you've uh, stopped at a Bedouin village uh, or even a town where, where, uh, where a Bedouin live, and you see that aside from a house, they have a tent in the back. The idea of the tent is that real living is desert living being out in the, in the desert, in a tent, not in a house, that you become purified by the sands of, of the desert and the, and the heat of, of the desert. Uh, what, what happened when Elijah went? He had been trying to hear the word of God. What happened when he went out to the desert? There he was able to hear the word of God. Remember the story of the still small voice, the still small voice that he heard in the, in the desert, in the, in the cacophony of the city, you wouldn't hear the word of God. But out in the desert, in the desert silence, there he heard the word of God. The still small voice, the kol de mama daka, that little thin voice of God that you can perceive when you go out to the desert. So that's another of the, the lessons that we find. There, there are just so many hundreds and thousands of these stories in the Bible which never happened. I don't believe that Elijah ever went out to the desert. I don't believe he had this confrontation. But the story is true because it teaches us something very, very basic, very important. And this is the way that I approach the Bible, not as a history book, not as fact, but rather what, what I'm trying to find out. The reason I love the Bible so much is what I'm trying to find out is what moved these people to tell these stories? I mean, think about it. It's absolutely amazing. The stories that we read in the Bible, uh, I'm thinking of uh, uh, the Gershwin, the stories you're liable to find in the Bible. <laughs> it ain't necessarily, ain't necessarily so. so. <laughs> <laughs> it ain't necessarily so. So it, it, true, it's not necessarily true, but it's true. Do you, do you understand okay. Yes. Uh, uh, Abe Trent has been trying to get your attention for the last five minutes. So he's, he's, he's unmuted now. Oh, okay. Abe? Yeah. Yes. Uh, also, the flip side is that several times in the desert, people come over to Moses and they say, why are you such a big deal? And why are you, are you running things? 
and we had it good in Egypt. We have lots of food and lots of, to drink. Why did you schlep us out to the desert? And I think uh, Eric Fromm in the 40s, I think, wrote a book, Escape from Freedom, about freedom right. being excellent, the responsibility <clears throat> you got to live up yeah. to. <clears throat> and I don't think it's a coincidence that Eric Fromm was Jewish. Oh, absolutely. It's a wonderful book. Uh, Fromm was very, very perceptive. Uh, and and uh, he, he's absolutely right. Uh, the, the constant carping against Moses was showing what human nature is. Now, again, do you believe the story? Do you believe that, that Moses hit the rock? You know, we, we, I remember when in our uh, young Zionist days, we used to have a song, al hasela ha ha al hasela ha ha Any of you remember that? Uh, yeah, I, I think, yeah. right. Uh, al hasela ha ha means uh, be, beat the rock, beat the rock. Vietzum bayim chayim. And, and living waters will come out. We used to sing it this way, uh, uh, just for to divert ourselves for just a few minutes. Al hasela ha ha, al hasela ha ha, al hasela ha ha. The eightsu mayim chayim, shoot the mayim to me, chayim. That's the way that we used to sing it. But uh, do we ever? Do we believe that this ever happened? No, of course not. I reject all of the miracles in the Bible, all of them. I don't have any favorite miracles. There is no such thing as a suspension of nature. And that's what a miracle is, a suspension of nature. Nature cannot be suspended. Nature goes on. Either we work with it or we don't work with it. But you cannot suspend the laws of nature. So then the question comes back again, why are these stories told? These stories are the, are the works of geniuses. Now, let, let's talk a bit about that word genius. We are blessed over the generations with certain people who somehow or other have a perception that goes beyond the perception of the ordinary human being. Now, I don't believe that some people are dumb and some people are smart. That's not it. What I mean by genius is a touch, something that has affected certain people, which simply cannot be explained naturally. Uh, in, in our generation, the, the person who I uh, consider to be the greatest of all geniuses was Albert Einstein. Uh, back in ancient times, the various prophets who, who left us with magnificent orations that go far beyond what you could expect of any normal human being. These are geniuses. And I believe somehow or other, far beyond my comprehension, but that in many generations, there are certain people who are born with a sensitivity to the natural world. And if you want, you can substitute the words sensitivity to God that makes them understand things which ordinary people cannot understand. They go beyond that. And that's the, the story of many of the prophets that we find in our Bible, that they had perceptions of things that the ordinary human beings living in their generation simply did not have. They went beyond that. They were geniuses. Uh, we'll, we'll be reading a few passages a bit later on, but uh, I, I don't want to Uh, by the way, one of the things that we say uh, as we're about to put the Torah back into the ark, uh, may, may, right before Eitz Chayim He, uh, we say Torah Adonai Tamima. The word of the Torah of God is perfect. Perfect. Now, you know, once we've decided that this is not the word of God, well, l let me amend that. Maybe we should define the word of God as the way that God has um, made it possible for certain people to have sensitivities and insights that ordinary people don't have, what I call genius. That the, the word of God is perfect in that the way that God created the human being makes it possible for us 
to understand things that ordinarily we would not understand, uh, that, that go beyond just the, the factual. As we said before, that uh, statement of the, the Russian uh, poet, from the merely real to the super real, to what goes beyond reality. And this is what the genius has. The genius is born with the same physical characteristics as everybody else, the real, but somehow or other goes far beyond the reality of ordinary life and understands things that you could say touched by God or, or somehow or other is different from the ordinary human being. And of course, we, we don't limit ourselves to Jews there. In every generation, there were geniuses like uh, Galileo and, and Copernicus and, and uh, you know, uh, others among the, the Greeks and the Europeans who were also geniuses, touched with genius. What, what we can be particularly proud of in our Jewish heritage is that so many of them are there in the, in the Bible. Now, I, I want to remind you of a Midrash which you are possibly familiar with. The story is told in the Midrash that uh, there was a big argument that was going on. It's in the book, by the way. This midrash is in the book, so you can look at it again at your leisure. That there was an argument going on in the academy in Jerusalem. The rabbis were arguing a certain point of law. Rabbi Eliezer, who was the greatest of them, had one opinion, and Rabbi Joshua uh, had another opinion. And they argued and argued and argued. Are any of you familiar with this particular midrash and how it goes? Is this about the walls leaning in? That's, that's right. That's part of it. Okay, continuing with it. So uh, Rabbi, uh, Rabbi Eliezer is so convinced of his point of view, even though he's now in the minority, but he was the greatest sage in the room at that time, that he says something like, uh, look out the window. You see that carob tree? If I'm right, let the carob tree be uprooted, and they all look out the window, and the carob tree is uprooted. And uh, they come back, and, and uh, they seem to be unimpressed. So he gets very, very angry, and he says, if the law is according to my interpretation, then let that river that's running outside there change its course and run the other way. And they all take out a look out the window, and what do they see? The river changes its course, goes the other way. Uh, and uh, again, he does not prevail. They do not vote, the rabbis do not vote along, along with him. He gets so angry that he says, if the law is according to my interpretation, let the walls of this academy fall in and the walls begin to crumble. And then Rabbi Joshua gets up and says these words, lo bashamayim he. Anybody know what that means? It's not in heaven. It is not in heaven. Lo bashamayimi. It is not in heaven. What did he mean by that? The answer to the machloket between the two was not in heaven, but it was up to the men to decide and to make their ruling. Right. That God gave us the Torah. God gave us the prophets. Once we have that, it is up to us to decide what the law is. And so in, in honor of Rabbi uh, Eliezer, the walls did not straighten up. And in honor of Rabbi Joshua, they did not fall in. It's a magnificent story. Did it ever happen? Of course it never happened. Nothing like that ever happened. But think of it. The rabbis told this story. My question is, why? Why did the rabbis tell that story? Because it's not up to God to fix the world. It's up to us. Possibly some people would like to say in partnership with God, I'm ready to say it's up to us to take care of the world. Right. What, what Rabbi Joshua was saying is, God gave us the Torah. The Torah is now ours. Now, I, I, when I say God gave us the Torah, you understand I'm talking in, in, um, in, in metaphor here, because we don't actually believe that. But the rabbis at that time did believe that the, that the Torah 
the prophets were the word of God. Okay, so this is the word of God. And there, Rabbi Eliezer was actually quoting the Torah as it exists, the law as it exists. And Rabbi Joshua was saying, we have the right, we rabbis here on earth have the right to dispute <clears throat> the, uh, the teaching of God because God gave us the Torah. It is now ours to interpret. And there's another Midrash that, that pretty much says the same thing. Uh, let, let's understand. When, when did these rabbis live? The rabbis that I'm talking about. These are first and second century rabbis of this era, first and, century, uh, first and second century rabbis. Uh, and uh, th the way that Judaism was being practiced in their day was very, very different from the way that Judaism was practiced back in biblical days. What was the main difference? How did Jews pray during biblical times? Sacrifices. The sacrifices, with animal sacrifices. How were they praying in the first and second century? The temple has been destroyed. Trying to figure it out. But Beit HaKnesset, I guess, the original beginnings of synagogue prayer. Right. Now, th think of it now. All right, we didn't have the temple. The temple was destroyed. But there were still the priests, the Kohanim. The Kohanim was still there. <clears throat> In fact, they made up a political party that we generally identify as the Sadducees. So the priesthood still existed. Wouldn't it have been possible to continue animal sacrifices, if not in the temple, uh, altar, build altars, uh, as, as was true back in biblical times? There could be altars all over the land of Israel. Why do they need the temple? The Torah specifically says virtually the entire book of Leviticus, much of Exodus, much of Numbers, much of Deuteronomy, talk about animal sacrifices. You must sacrifice these animals in order to get the pleasure of God. And suddenly the rabbis in the first and second century say, no sacrifices. Where do they get that authority? How could they say that? They're going against the word of the Torah. Well, let me give you, an, let me give you, an, uh, do I hear somebody? It was an excuse for them. When the temple was destroyed, it gave them an opportunity to say that because they said Excellent. we can't do it because the, te the temple isn't there. Excellent. Excellent answer. They were looking for an excuse to end animal sacrifice because they had gone beyond it. They no longer felt that this is something that the God, as they understood God, wanted. And so what did they substitute for sacrifice? Sure. Prayer. 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 At the same time that the three daily sacrifices were given, morning, afternoon, and night, they instituted Shachrit, Mincha, and Mahariv. And uh, they, they, uh, they began the earliest stages of this. They would do it at the time, exactly at the time when the animal sacrifices were supposed to be given in Jerusalem. Those are the times when they had these three different prayer services that we still have to this day. Now, let me give you another Midrash, another one of my favorites. Moses is on the, on the peak of Mount Sinai. God has just given him the Ten Commandments. And uh, Moses is about to leave with the commandments, and suddenly he gets an idea. He says to God, God, please let me see how these commandments that you gave me and that I'm going to be giving to the people of Israel, how are these commandments going to be observed in the future? Uh, in, in uh, let's say in, in uh, 200 years, in 500 years, how are these laws going to be observed by the Jewish people? Will they still take what I'm bringing down, the teaching that I'm giving them, the commandments and the Torah, are they still going to be observing it? So God says, all right, Moshele, I will, I will allow you to see what's going to happen to your law in the future. So what does God do? He projects Moses into the academy of Rabbi Akiba. That's second century, Rabbi Akiba. So 
what, what, what does he hear in, in Rabbi Akiva's academy? He sits down in the back row and he listens and he listens and he listens and he doesn't understand a word of what they're talking about, not a word. So Moses returns to God and he says, God, why, why did you send me there? I don't understand a word that they're talking about. So God says, let me send you back for just a minute and you'll hear what they have to say. And he goes back to the academy and again, they're discussing things that he can't understand. And then when the lesson is over, the rabbi, Gamle, rabbi Akiba says, Halacha Lamoshe Misinai. Can anybody interpret that for me? The laws of Israel from the, the laws of Moses from Sinai. That this, what I'm teaching, Rabbi Akiba is saying to his class, what I am teaching you now is the law given to Moses at Sinai. <laughs> And Moses is satisfied. He's satisfied. It's his law. Now, what is that Midrash teaching us? There is such a profound lesson in that Midrash that justifies the development of Judaism into conservative, reform, reconstructionist, uh, the, the development of Judaism down through the centuries. What is that Midrash teaching us? It gives a flexibility in 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 uh, in explaining things to the people of the time and of the place that the questions are asked. Yes. About the law. Any, anybody the else? The law is interpreted by people, by men. Right, right. That's the important thing. That the law has to be interpreted generation after generation after generation that there are certain laws that are in the Torah, to begin with animal sacrifice, that are absolutely impossible for us to do in this generation. Not only because we don't have a temple, but because it's against the mores of the time. I mean, who believes that God has an appetite and wants uh, sweet, savory meats uh, to waft up to heaven? Uh, the whole idea of, of wafting up to heaven, that the heaven above, you know, the, the whole idea is so anthropomorphic so, so um, childish. So what the Midrash is teaching us that each generation has the Torah and has to teach us to teach it according to the lights of their particular period. That's the important thing. It legitimizes biblical interpretation. So in other words, it's telling us that here we have this wonderful literature of the Bible and it has all kinds of stories in it but that we have to interpret them according to the lights of our generation, not the time of, of Moses. It, it, it's almost unbelievable to me that the rabbis, the Pharisees, would tell such a story. That wh why do you think they told it? Were the rabbis under a have to fit there, yeah. What's that? Wouldn't it have to do with the would it have to do with the first destruction of the temple? You had a community in Babylonia where there's no, nobody knows what to do. So at that point, and that's where our first academies were also established. At that point, the discussion begins among, I don't know if I want to call them Rabbonim at that point, but, and the whole tradition begins of the Torah Sheva yeah. Alpha, yeah. which enables us wherever we're at, whenever we're at, whatever the conditions are, to interpret Torah in a way that makes it possible for us to remain true to a tradition, to halakha, and to maintain our peoplehood. Right. And, uh, let me explain the difference between the Pharisees and the Sadducees, uh, Purushim in Hebrew and Sadukim. The Pharisees were the rabbinic party, the democratic, you could say the democratic party. They, they were the one, the, 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 the people, the rabbis who taught the people. And by the way, that, that term rabbi simply uh, evolved. Uh, Rav, back in ancient times, simply meant a teacher. So um, uh, the, the whole idea of the rabbinate, going back to about the time of uh, right after Hillel. Remember, Hillel is not called Rabbi Hillel, he's called Hillel. But in the next generation, they begin being called rabbi. 
Rabbi Tarfon, Rabbi Akiba, Rabbi Elazar, Rabbi Joshua, and so on. Uh, the Pharisees were the party of the rabbis trying to make the Torah alive in their generation. The Sadducees were the priestly party. The priestly party, which was mostly the wealthy people and, and of course the priests, were trying to maintain the status quo before the destruction. They wanted the priesthood to be in power. Uh, in, in one of the prophets we read, that the Sifte uh, Kohen Yishmerudat, that the, the lips of the Kohen are supposed to preserve knowledge. But the fact of the matter was that the lips of the Kohen were not preserving knowledge. The Kohenim, for the most part, the wealthy classes, they lived on, these, on the donations of the people, and they were not teachers, and they were not particularly learned, which is what the prophet said that a, a Kohen should be. And back in the days of the prophets, that was the, one of the functions of the Kohanim was to be the teachers of the people. But they were no, no longer capable of being the teachers of the people. By the way, do you remember in, in Yom Kippur afternoon, we have a whole service that's called the Avoda. You're familiar with that, the, the Avoda, that we read in Yom Kippur afternoon. Do you remember, it, it, there's a long passage in the Avoda that teaches you how the Kohen Gadol, the high priest, was to act uh, in the day leading up to Yom Kippur, how he was to purify himself, how he must not sleep that night, how he uh, has to guard against any kind of uncleanliness, and he has to have teachers with him who are telling him the laws of Yom Kippur all night long so that he should know what to do. Now, what is that telling you about the priests, the Kohanim? And he didn't know much in terms of They ritual. didn't know much. They were not the learned ones. They were the Sadducees, not the learned party, the wealthy party, the aristocratic party. Where the knowledge was coming from was the rabbis, the teachers. And you had to have teachers along with the Kohen so that he should know what to do because they simply did not trust the knowledge of the Kohen himself. So we see this, this evolution that's going on that we call the, the origins of the rabbinate. And the important thing about the evolution of the rabbinate is that it gives Judaism the ability to adjust to the circumstances of each generation. We're not stuck in the mold of the biblical period, but rather we can progress and, uh, and meet the challenges of every age according to the lights, the genius of the people living during that generation. And it also puts the practice in the hands. It wants to make every person, I don't know if I want to say it this way, but it wants to make every person a priest, meaning that it takes the practice and writes it and describes it in such a way that anybody can do it. We don't need priests any longer. And at the time when, after the temple was destroyed, Jews were wondering what's the future gonna be? And we had all these different sects. One of them turned out to be Christianity, which did elevate the priests and still has priests today who pretty much <laughs> determine, discuss what it is that's gonna happen. Right. So rabbis put it into the hands of all Jews. Made it, I should put it that way, made it possible for all Jews to participate. They democratized. What, what is that? They democratized it. Right, they democratized it. And what happens when you have a system which is controlled by priests? Take a look at, at what's going on in the Catholic Church today, <laughs> where the, the priests, or the, the Pope, and, and uh, the cardinals are dominant in deciding what the law is. The, the Catholic Church to this very day says that women are inferior. Now, it's, uh, and I, I, if, if there's anything that I've learned through 65 years of marriage is that women are not inferior. <laughs> uh, and, but, but how in this generation, how in this year 2020, can a church be teaching that women are inferior, that they're not capable of the priesthood, that they're not capable of, of, of being the, the leaders of a religion? So, so it, it's something power which is, very, is, what power is, that? is very power is very seductive 
and is very heady and people don't want to relinquish it. That's the opposite right. of democracy essentially. And that's exactly. what's happened and, and, it's, and, and it's a patriarchal one. It's terrible. And what they've got and, there, and, and, they're happy to live, figure it out. And, and as you all know, Lord Acton taught power corrupts and absolute yep. power corrupts ab Corrupt, absolutely. absolutely. This is what's okay. going on in the Catholic Church today. And it, it's got to change. It's either going to change or it's going to wither away. Yeah. It may not be in our lifetime. Yes, please. Uh, Nada? Is it, yeah. Um, isn't it very similar to what happens with ultra, ultra, ultra Orthodox people? Yeah. Don't, they, don't they think exactly the same way? You Absolutely. can't get married in Israel unless you get married by a, an Orthodox, very Orthodox rabbi. Absolutely. And by the way, did you see the pictures in the news today of uh, the uh, Hasidic sect in Brooklyn who were refusing to uh, social separation and wearing a, a, a face mask and the yeshiva, was, the yeshiva was closed down? I mean, here are people, believe it or not, in the, 20, in, the, in the 21st century, in the year 2020, who simply will not accept the fact that there are other people in the world who, who count, who exist, and, and who have equal rights with them. And so they'll go along without face masks and they'll congregate together. Why? Because uh, Yisrael batach baronai, Israel trust in God. God will take care of everything. That, that's their attitude. How can a, an intelligent, how can a, a person with a mind have that kind of, of thinking today? Uh, if I may. Uh, yes. Uh, I'm thinking, I can't help but think of this, of the U.S. I, I'm losing you, losing you. The he U.S. what? The Constitutionists who, who don't want, who want to say that the Constitution was written and is, okay. you, 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 you get dragged kicking and screaming into the 21st century. And you're the people who are the strict Constructionists are Catholics. And the people you're, who you're are absolutely right. Are the Jews, and I, I think I'm making the connection again uh, between Jewish thinking. You're, you're absolutely right about the Supreme Court. There's a uh, yeah. there's a, a school of thought in in the Supreme Court, what's called originalism, that anything which was written by the founding fathers cannot be changed. This is exactly the orthodox point of view about what's in the Torah and the Bible, that it cannot be changed. But generation after generation, the rabbis have taught us that it can be changed. You know, th there was a reaction that set in, uh, especially uh, in, in Europe at the beginning of the 20th century. There's, there's, there, was, there was a great Orthodox rabbi who taught kol chadash asur. Can anybody translate Everything that? Everything that's new is forbidden. What's that? Everything that's new is forbidden. Right, everything which is new is forbidden. He was reacting against the modernism of Europe, uh, which, you know, to a certain extent is understandable, the, the, uh, the mores of society uh, that he saw, particularly in Western countries like Germany, were being debated. And so he, he ruled kol chadash asur, everything which is forbidden. Uh, Shem, that's the Shem. idea. It's the idea of originalists in our Supreme Court. It was the idea of the Sadducees in the day in the first and second century that the word of God cannot be changed. And you know, you, you find that so much in what's called evangelical Christianity. Uh, I, I quote in my book, uh, I can only paraphrase it now because I'm not looking at the book, but there was a, a convention of evangelical Protestants which uh, announced. Uh, absolutely, with, with absolute faith, that everything which is in the Bible is absolutely true, and not one word can be changed. This yeah, is Shem. the evangelical point. What is that? Hashem, it's more. Um, I have to take exception to, you know, this whole line of, of what you're saying. Yes. Not in the conclusion, uh, but in the process that you're taking to get there. Uh, I don't think it is appropriate for us to judge other people's value systems. 
uh, and make value and in turn make value judgments on them. Uh, I think within the Orthodox community, um, they have the right and the ability, well, they have the ability, and I think the right to make their own interpretations and their, their own halacha. Uh, the same with uh, Christianity and anybody else. Uh, I think we then have the right to either say, we don't agree with you, and therefore we're going to go our own way. Um, but we can't knock uh, and, and put down what they believe. Um, mm. Because then that opens us up to being knocked and put down for what we believe. After all, a lot of what we believe was new and radical at one time. I mean, this is, I think, the whole point of what you're talking about tonight. Um, and, and therefore, can we say that? And therefore, can we really say that about others? I think well, it's, I, no, it's very different. Go, go, go ahead. ahead. Go ahead. I say it, I find it really, I think what Moore is saying, I understand and I agree with him on a certain level. But I find that when the evangelicals, particularly through some of the members of the Supreme Court, are in a position to make law of the land for everyone and interpret a constitution that gives all religions protection, uh, then I find it like it is my business and I find it very difficult. And well, I don't different. like- But that's different than what I'm talking about. Yeah. I mean, if you have, if you have a, uh, a legal decision that is done within the framework of our overall legal system in the United States, we can, we can deal with that. And we can deal with, we may win, we may lose, but we can deal with it. But that's not saying that the belief, the belief that motivated that judge is wrong. Well, we'll disagree with it, and therefore it's wrong in, in our moral sense. But we can't say that it's, he's wrong for believing it in the first place. Well, I, I, I hate to differ with my good friend Mort, but, uh, but I, I must. Uh, certain people. Certain I must people, disagree with you. You have that right. <laughs> you have that right. Certain people in in certain generations have held beliefs which are not only wrong and have been proven to be wrong, but are destructive to society. Uh, a simple example from today: a person goes around in the city today, who walk, walking in the streets of Philadelphia without a face mask. Now, w w what are they saying? What are they saying when they do that? They're yeah, saying, nice. I don't give a damn about whether or not uh, uh, another person gets disease from me. I don't give a damn. They have Just to be like, and I'm exercising my freedom. Just like I, guess the president. What, I don't disagree with you. But what I was saying is that when we were talking a little while ago, we were talking with such wide brush strokes that we were including everybody. So, so we have some people running around without masks. Uh, I don't think they're right. Um, and we may or we, we can have a, another discussion as to whether Art, they have- Mort, Mor let, let me ask you this. When the, when the uh, Arab terrorists attacked Malot and the Haredim in Israel said that the reason why the children in Malot were killed was because the mezuzot on their doorposts were not kosher. Do right. they have a right but to say that? They have a right to say that, but do we have to blame the entire Orthodox or Hasidic community for that small section of people who said it? Oh, of course not. Well, well that's not, what I'm saying. That's what I'm saying. I think we, were talking, we were talking before in such broad strokes no, that no, we no, were blaming no. everybody within orthodoxy as, as being out in left field. No, 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 not saying that at all. I was raised in an orthodox home. I, I enjoy being with my orthodox family. I love to sit at a Shabbat table with them and go to shul with them and daven with them. But there are certain things that they believe that are absolutely 100% wrong wrong. My, and, and I will agree about my Orthodox family. Right. Okay, so let's proceed from there. Uh, <laughs> I, 
cover uh, more by this time. But there are certain things that I, want, that I want to look at in, in our textbook uh, that, that I hope that you will uh, read. Uh, Jim, can uh, I ask uh, you one question? I ask yes, you one but, question with a little tongue in cheek here, just a little bit. Yeah. I mean, we, we celebrate Tisha B'Av because of the destruction of the temple. But it's that same event which gave rise to rabbinic Judaism. Absolutely. Good question. And so, and my, well, my question is, my question is, should we end our mourning and our fasting on Tisha B'Av with a Misibah? <laughs> I'm, I'm very glad, Shlom, I'm very glad that you raised that question. Because to me, Tisha B'Av is a time of celebration because the temple was destroyed. If the temple had not been destroyed, Judaism would have been set back a century, two centuries, three centuries, because somehow or other the sacrificial cult would have persisted. And the sacrificial cult, the way that I understand God, is absolutely against the word of God. I don't believe that God ever wanted sacrifices. You know, one of the prophets said it this way, Ma'asti saneti zivchechem. I hate I despise your sacrifices. So to me, the fact that the temple was destroyed, which, which absolutely animal sacrifice without you know, a period of transition was one of the greatest things that's happened, one of the most liberating things that's happened in the history of Judaism. And I'll tell you, one of the only reasons why I still, uh, um, I wouldn't say I, I uh, believe that we should uh, not celebrate, but uh, observe Tisha B'Av is because of the wonderful series of prophecies from Deutero Isaiah that follow uh, Tisha B'Av, what we call the Sheva de Nechemta. Uh, those prophecies from Deutero Isaiah, and I'm going to read one of them now because to me it's, it's one of the most magnificent points in the entire Bible. Those prophecies of Nechemta, I hope when you're in the synagogue between uh, Tisha B'Av and Rosh Hashanah that you pay attention to those Haftarot. They are gorgeous. They're absolutely, if ever there were genius, in, 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 if ever God gave anybody genius, Deuter Isaiah in some of these prophecies is just so magnificent. Aside from the fact that it's probably from the time of Deuter Isaiah that we have even one universal God. He's the first prophet that actually spells out clear terms that there's one God over the entire universe and not just one God for the Jews and one God for the Babylonians and so on. So he was a, an, an absolute genius. And I, I want to read for you, for you one of the passages uh, in, the, in the Bible, in, in one of these, uh, uh, which is, uh, which is absolutely magnificent. Professional version. Do I hear something? What? All right, con continuing then. Every time that I read this particular section from the uh, prophecy from the Haftarah uh, during the uh, period between Tisha B'Av and Rosh Hashanah, it moves me to tears. I think that this, this particular passage is one of the most beautiful in the literature of humanity. Uh, the people in the days of Deutero Isaiah are coming back from exile. They believe that their God has forsaken them. Isaiah is trying to teach them that there is one God over the entire universe, that their God has not forsaken them, but rather that God still exists and that they should worship God and that God has not been defeated. So the, the people are crying. So they say, La Tomer Zion. Azavani Adonai. God, Zion has said, God has forsaken me. If, picture if you can. Um, to me, that, that, that scene of the prophet approaching these people who are sitting and weeping because they believe that they've been abandoned by their God. But Tomertzion, Zion says, Azavani Adonai. God has forsaken me. And what does the prophet answer? Hatishkach isha ula merachem ben bitna gam eila tishkachna va'anochi lo eshkachech. 
I'm going to translate. Absolutely gorgeous. Can a woman forget her baby or disown the child of her womb? Though she might forget, I will never forget you. See, I have engraved you on the palms of my hands. Have you ever heard anything that gorgeous? I mean, it, it's transcendent. It, it moves me to tears every time I read it. Any reaction? That's our Bible. Now, I was going to read sections of the Bible that I disagree with. There, there are a whole bunch of inconsistencies in, in, in the Bible, especially in the Torah, where it says one thing in one place and another thing in another place. Absolute inconsistency. For example, uh, the, uh, the idea that God visits the sins of the, of, the, uh, of the parents unto the children to the third and fourth generation. Uh, that's in the Torah, repeated a couple of times. That pokeh davon avot al banim al shileshim v'al rebidim l'son ai, that God remembers the sins of the fathers to the third and fourth generation. Do we believe that? How do we come not to believe it? Because the, there was a prophet, Ezekiel, and in other a couple of other places in the Bible also, where it says the children, the, the parents have eaten sour grapes. And the, the, uh, they said that there's a prophecy, or there's a saying in Israel, that the parents have eaten sour grapes and the teeth of the children are set on edge. This is not true, the prophet says. This is not true. Every person will live and be rewarded and punished according to his own deeds, not because of his parentage. Uh, that we cannot, we cannot be governed in what we do in our lives because of our lineage, because of some evil people who have had influence over us. Now, I give that as an example of where a prophet living in a later generation absolutely disagrees, 100% disagrees with what has been written in the Torah. Another thing in the Torah, uh, many times God says to, to Moses, that a human being cannot see my face and live. You're familiar with that? The human Moses cannot see the face of God and live. And in another place, it says that Moses saw God face to face. Now, I'll give this just as a couple of examples of how uh, there are things that are in the Torah that prove to us that the Torah is not absolutely 100% perfect, not Torah Adonai Tamima, the Torah of, the word, uh, of God is perfect, but rather, that generations wrote what they believed in their generations, and that generation after generation, we have to come to terms with what they thought in those times and bring it up to date to our times. Never forget that Midrash of Moses sitting in the Academy of Rabbi Akiba. He can't understand what they're talking about. Why can't he understand what they're talking about? Because they're living a thousand years later than he. Society has developed, mores have developed, Culture has developed. It's no longer something that a person living in the generation of Moses could have understood. That's why we have to have a progression from Moses to Einstein all the way. Every generation adding new knowledge to the world through the genius that God has implanted as a possibility, a possibility in every generation that there are certain people who are somehow touched by this infinite intelligence, as Einstein put it, what we try to do is to discover God's lines after him. We try to approach the edges of understanding of God, realizing full well that we will never understand God, that because God is infinite and we do not have any concept of infinity, we can't approach infinity, that we will never get to the essence. But that what the genius does is to touch the hem of the garment of God. The genius is the one who's able to perceive something that ordinary human beings cannot perceive. And this is so very, very important in our understanding of the Torah. Uh, I, I hope that you're going to read the chapter uh, on, on the Bible. It happens to be my favorite chapter in the book. 
And uh, j just to end on, on a uh, very positive uh, uh, note, uh, oh, by, by the way, before I get to that, uh, one of the passages that I quote uh, to, to talk about how we've progressed since the times of the Bible is the paragraph on the sota, that is a woman who's suspected of adultery and the part of the uh, trial by ordeal. It's the only case in the entire Bible where we have a case of trial by ordeal where she has to drink certain liquid, ashes mixed with water, and if her belly swells up, she's, uh, she's uh, guilty. If her belly doesn't swell up, she's not guilty. This is in the Torah. This, this primitive nonsense is in our Torah because back in those days, people believed it. We've got to be able to have the courage to go beyond that and say that because people believe things like that, back in ancient times, does not mean that we are guided by it. At the same time that we reject those certain things in the Bible, there are certain things like that passage that I read to you from Deuteronomy Isaiah that are so transcendent, so gorgeous, that the Bible, as I said right at the outset tonight, is a book that I've devoted my, my whatever scholarship I have to the, to the Bible because there's just so much in it. Uh, there was a saying of, of a rabbi by the name of Ben Bagbag, Afokhba, the Afokhba, the cholaba, turn it and turn it again. Everything is in it. Everything is in it. It is our obligation and our generation to evaluate, to read these things. Do they have meaning for us today? Do they teach us something? And because I, I love the Bible so much, and we're approaching the uh, the end of our session, I I, I want to read to you one of the most sublime passages. In the book of the in the Bible, by the way, uh, we were talking about uh, certain things that the Orthodox believe and and uh, and that uh, we agree with or we don't agree with. Uh, I, I discovered through my family, especially the family in Israel who run a, a yeshiva, and who are um, I won't call them Haredim, but uh, very very uh, pious Jews, and I discovered something very interesting that most, most even learned or semi-learned Orthodox Jews, and for that matter, I'd say conservative Reform Jews also, do not know the Bible except for the Haftarot. They know the Torah, they know the Haftarot, and that's it. And I'm, what I'm going to end up with is reading from the book of Job. I've yet to find a, a an ordinary Orthodox Jew who has any familiarity whatsoever with the book of Job. And I think that's true of most Jews everywhere, that although they've heard of Job, they know what Job is supposed to be teaching, but to actually study the book of Job and to read the poetry in the book of Job, this is something that people do not do. So I'm going to conclude with one little passage at the end of the book of Job. Uh, after Job has been uh, gone through his suffering and uh, has been, uh, and God asks him, where were you when I created the foundations of the world? In other words, you petty mortal, how can you question the judgment of God? And finally he says, I, I accept, uh, I, I spoke and, and I'll read this passage. I know that you can do everything that nothing you propose is impossible for you. Who is this who obscures counsel without knowledge? Indeed, I spoke without understanding of things beyond me, which I did not know. Hear now, and I will speak. I will ask, and you will inform me. I had heard you with my ears, but now I see you with my eyes. Therefore, I repent and relent, being but dust and ashes. Now, what Job is saying here, the conclusion of the book of Job, is that there are things that are simply beyond our understanding, but that if we believe that there is an infinite intelligence that rules the world, that created the world with justice, that we simply accept that fact and understand that we are very limited in our human knowledge. And what we have to do, as Einstein taught us, 
is to strive to reach those edges of the garment of God to make us understand even a, an iota of what it means to love God. And unless there are some questions and comments here, we'll stick to our schedule and conclude here. And thank you very much. You're very welcome. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. You're welcome. Good night, all. Be Good well. Night. See you next night. week. Stay well. Good night. Take care. There is, there is another. There is another one next week. Correct. Yes. Yeah. One yeah. more. One more. Yeah. Okay. Bye bye. Right. Good night. Bye bye. So. Stay yeah. healthy. Yeah. All right. I resigned out. Okay. <laughs>